honored to be here. I've known Chad and Risa for a few years. We go way back, Chad and I do, to Wichita Falls days, and um, extraordinary servant of God. What a, what a great team of servant leaders God's blessed the Highland Oaks Church with. Um, John Mulliken, uh, an amazing, extraordinary leader. I've come to know Pat over the last few years. I have such uh, such respect for who he is and for his extraordinary gifts. Um, you are very blessed. Barry and Diane Packer, we go back 20-something years. We've got stories to tell. They are dear friends, and I know a blessing to you. So, so many of you, uh, there are connections. My family is here. Uh, they're members here. My mother and father um, my brother and his family, and so it's just a, an incredible gift, um, and I'm thankful to be uh, among you and with you uh, today to share and worship in this way and um, to think with you about God's purpose for you and for the world and how we participate in all of that. Hey, we just moved here maybe six weeks ago. We landed in Dallas, Texas. We've been in Abilene for 14 years. Uh, with uh, ACU and uh, are excited to be in Dallas, Texas. John mentioned earlier as part of ACU's initiative to extend its presence with a campus here in Dallas, Texas. And, um, and so I want to I wanna say just a word about that and ask for your prayers uh, for us, for our family as we settle in here for what God might do through ACU as it comes to reside here among you and and again, participate in what God's doing. The idea is that we want to extend ACU's presence to meet students where they are, and primarily students, a different kind of student for adult students who have already begun their careers and families, and um, we want to walk alongside and partner with those students who, who might want to advance their career with the knowledge and skills they need to be successful and leaders of influence while at the same time helping, uh, partnering to understand how each of our identities, how our gifts are to be stewarded for God's greater purpose, reclaiming that notion of vocation that emerges from the Christian tradition, that who we are and what we do in our work is a part of something bigger than ourselves, and how we're called to step into the places where we live and places where we work with an understanding of our calling as disciples of Jesus. And so we're really excited about the opportunity to do that with uh, programs in graduate programs in professional areas. And so pray for us. Pray for uh, our ability to partner with more and more students both in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and beyond across the country as, um, as we think about what it means to be people who take up our life and our work for the sake of Jesus. Is Sally Gary here? There, there you are. Hi, Sally. I love Sally. I just had to stop and say that. Sally and I go way back as well. Um, good to see you, Sally. The word of God for us today comes from Acts, the first chapter. It's really uh, this part of the series on purpose as Pat has shaped it. It uh, comes from this passage in Acts chapter 1 where... Uh, Jesus, just after his resurrection, is speaking to his followers, to the disciples. And these are the words, so I would invite you to hear this passage from Acts chapter 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. Let's bow together and give thanks. God, for your word living, eternal and true, we offer you our thanks. We offer you our deep gratitude because you are present by your word and by your spirit and in your word and in your spirit you move toward us across all that would separate us from hearing your voice and knowing your truth and living in your love you move toward us by your word and by your spirit and so we open ourselves your people in this place open ourselves to receive your word come Lord Jesus may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray in the name of Jesus, the word become flesh. Amen. Jesus says, You will receive power. He says that to the disciples who, in the afterglow of his resurrection, are just trying to put the pieces together and figure out what's next. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He says to those gathered in this room, all of us in some way or another, at some point in the journey, perhaps from different starting places and at different places along the way, but all of us trying to figure out how to put all this together. He says to us, look, you, my people, will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will receive power and you will be my witnesses. The witness will be your words. They'll be those disciples' words, those first disciples, but they'll also be your words. The witness will be your words for sure. But you know, from the very beginning, words met by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God hovering over the surface of whatever it is that brings chaos and disconnection in our lives, when the Word and the Spirit comes together, an event happens. Something moves. In the very foundations of the earth, something moves. God is there, and it is good. It's words for sure, but words accompanied by the Spirit will do something. They will move you. They will propel you forward. They will move you with power from the places that you know, from the places that are familiar, from the places you've established that are comfortable, places of great blessing and places that you know, with people that you know, with whom you are very comfortable because they're mostly like you. And they've had experiences that are very similar to you. You can refer to them. You can laugh about them. You can cry about them, but they're the same experiences. Oh, when the Holy Spirit comes with power and propels you forward by God's Word, you will move from the places that you know to the places that you do not know so well, to the people that you do not know so well or understand, and it's uncomfortable 
and it's a little unsettling. And often it can be frightful and fearful. But when the Holy Spirit comes by God's word and sends you forth from Jerusalem, the place that you know, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, to Judea and Samaria, there is witness. And there is an event. You will cross the boundary. You will cross a border and something will happen. You understand, don't you? That they had gone, Jewish people had gone to great lengths to find ways around Samaria, right? They had built whole new roads to avoid going to Samaria. Whatever you do, don't go to Samaria. Bad news, the Samaritans. And yet Jesus stands in this moment just after the resurrection anticipating his ascension and says you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and because the Holy Spirit is upon you you're going to move across boundaries and borders like that. In September of 2006 I stood at the border between the United States and Mexico crossing over into Juarez. We had taken a route in New Mexico to cross at Santa Teresa. We had taken that route, the Santa Teresa crossing had been created because things were so terribly uh, busy and clogged at El Paso and the bridges that crossed there and so Santa Teresa over time had come up as an alternative crossing into, uh, from New Mexico into Mexico, into the city of Juarez. I think it's interesting, Santa Teresa, the Santa Teresa crossing, and I thought as I made my way there, that sounds familiar, Teresa, Teresa. And I remembered Teresa of Avila, 16th century mystic, who wrote words like this, you'll see them on the screen. Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on the world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. You are his body. I stood at the border at Santa Teresa my mind swirling, remembering that 16th century mystic, but also catching sight of the walls and fences and razor wire and guards with skin color different than mine, with machine guns. And my heart began to race just a little bit. And the adrenaline began to flow. There were searches and questions and all of those things as we approached the border. I was with my friend Roger, who happens to be here this morning. Roger and I had met in Buffalo Gap, Texas. I'll say more about it in a moment. I had been invited to speak out at a church in Las Cruces and said to him, I'm going to go speak at this church in Las Cruces, and on Saturday when we have some free time, they're going to take us take me across the border to visit Juarez. I want to see the maquilas. Want to go? I was just ribbing him, thinking he'd be jealous, and he said, yeah, I'll go. Everybody needs a friend like that. And so Roger and I crossed the border together, eyes wide open, uncertain, unsure. We made our way across, and we drove around, and we observed the maquilas, and they too had fences around them with razor wire and I wondered was that to keep people from getting in or people from getting out I wasn't sure I had all these questions we drove around we looked at the city we made our way through our guides showing us through and then we pulled off the paved road onto 
a dirt road filled with potholes into a barrio on the west side of the city of Juarez. We came around the corner. We pulled up to a cinder block, small cinder block cell, uh, a house. It had a fence around it with more razor wire. And out came this beautiful young couple and their four young children and they smiled and they waved and they embraced us and they invited us in and they fed us and they loved us. And by the end of the day, when we had crossed back across the border, Roger and I sat together and looked at each other and there were no words. We had experienced something like we had never experienced before. We had experienced something of God in the face of those people, in the voice of those people, in the touch of those people, and we couldn't even talk the same language. We had met God there. We thought that we were coming maybe to be a witness, to be sent by God to Judea and Samaria, is to take God to Judea and Samaria across boundaries and borders and places where people of God just don't go. Maybe that's what it is, but wonder of all wonders, when we stepped across and into that space, God was there. And we experienced the love of God in astonishing ways. Beyond the words, meeting God that day led me to believe that the witness was in the encounter made possible in the act of moving across the border, across the boundaries, across all that would conspire to separate people. When you make that move, God shows up. And I think that's true because this is the essence of who God is and what God has always done. We follow the God who crosses every boundary, who crosses every border in the act of creation itself. God speaks by God's Word and God's Spirit and something happens and God comes to dwell in the midst of it. Isn't that what Genesis 1 says? He's present there. And God's own people walk with Him. God's present in the act of creation. Why? Because God's love compels God to be present there in the creation. And have you ever thought that in the act of creating, God called forth a created order and people who would be created for relationship with God, for love of God, and because they were created for relationship and for love, that God might risk being wounded by the very creation and the created ones he had called forth. that God moves across the boundaries of time and space and heaven and earth and dwells with human beings in a risky, vulnerable act of love. That's profound that God's love could be that big, that God's love could be that great, that God would step across the threshold to be present with the ones that God created and be wounded by those that he had created. And yet that's what happens, isn't it? amazing story that unfolds the God who calls forth a creation and, and people and then creates a people in Israel and pledges God's love to those people to Israel and Israel pledges its love back right and then lo and behold Israel turns its back on God and God says this is through the prophets like Hosea God says Oh, I loved you. It was I who taught you to walk. Who from the time you were little took your little hands and held them as you wobbled on your legs. I taught you, my people. I walked with you. I held you. I loved you. And when you got old enough to walk on your own, You rejected me, and you despised me, 
and you wounded me. God says through the prophet, my heart is broken and troubled. And I keep loving you and you keep going from me and I keep loving you and you keep going from me. I ought to be done with you by now, but I can't. This is the God who keeps moving towards his people in an act of love, who keeps moving towards people who will wound him. This is the God who in the fullness of time rends the heavens and earth and comes down, crosses the boundary of heaven and comes down in the fragility of an infant who's born in a manger out back who comes for the sake of love to embody love who extends that love and then what happens in the face of God's love but God is wounded and killed by God's own creation this is the God who keeps coming towards us in love who keeps crossing every boundary for the sake of love this is the Jesus who told stories like, you know, there was a father who had two sons. And you know the story of the older brother and the younger brother and the younger brother who goes off and squanders the, the gift and shames his father and yet the father does what? The father can't help it. The father stands and watches and waits and watches and waits and when the time comes that the son turns do you know what the father does he doesn't say I knew it I knew it here he comes see if he can make it all the way here what does he do he steps down and he runs towards him he takes on the shame he takes on the ridicule that should be the sons, he runs to meet him. Because that's how great the love of the God is who crosses every boundary. It's this Jesus telling this story about these two sons who will show them what it is to walk from Jerusalem to Samaria and sit there. Not around Samaria, but walk to Samaria. We hardly can grasp how astonishing that must have been. This is the God who will show us in Jesus what it is to walk from Jerusalem to Samaria and sit at the well. This is the God who in Jesus, though the teachers and Pharisees are very concerned with keeping boundaries, will make his way across every one of them. And this is the Jesus who will say to those disciples and will say to you, will say, at the essence of who God is, at the essence of what I've come to show you, is a way for you to live across every boundary. Paul envisions the church as witness as a boundary crossing people a church that will as relentlessly as God himself choose to cross every boundary a church that will not sit back and say well maybe if they'll come to meet us on our terms we can get together but a church who will say because the love of God compels and because the presence of Jesus in the world showed us the way, and because we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, we will cross every boundary to reach every person for whom life has conspired to separate and break and fracture, no matter what it is. We'll cross every boundary. It means that the church, the followers of Jesus, who have so often thought of themselves as boundary keepers will re-identify themselves as boundary crossers. Radical, risk-taking, vulnerable boundary crossers.
The church, in some sense, is a series, the church's life is a series of experiments in boundary crossing. I mentioned my friend Roger in Buffalo Gap a few minutes ago. He spent about 10, 12 years preaching in that little church south of Abilene. Small little town, I mean, four or 500 people, little stone church building with, I don't know, not, not even 100 people there. Mostly a commuter church, believe it or not. Most people would drive out from Abilene because, I don't know if you know Buffalo Gap, but there are live oaks there, and in West Texas, that's rare. It's beautiful. Kind of a nice setting, Sunday drive out to church. It's a commuter church, or people live further out in the country and drive into the little town. It's mostly a commuter church. Not a lot of people live there who go to church there. We noticed this along the way, and we began to think maybe... Maybe God would have us pour our life out into the lives of people in our community. And so we tried to figure out, well, how would you do that? I mean, we've been here a long time. That church had been there for a long, long time. And people didn't just take it upon themselves to just say, hey, well, let's just go show up down there at the church. So we were, how do you do that? And one, one of the old fellows in the church scratched his head and thought to himself, well, you know what? If I wanted to get to know my neighbors, you know what I'd do? I'd go out back and I'd fire up the grill. And I'd holler at the neighbors and say, hey, y'all come over, we're cooking. He said, I'd throw a big cookout and invite people to come and eat with me. We thought, that's a great idea. So that's what the church did. Everybody got excited. We're going to throw a community cookout. And we made plans. We had committees. We had people rounding up food. We had people making signs and putting flyers out. And it was on a Sunday night. And the time came for a community cookout, and we had word had spread, and everybody was doing their job and setting up tables, and the grills were out there, and smoke was coming up off the grill, and people were back in the kitchen chopping onions and lettuce and tomatoes. We set it all out there, waited, all of us from the church. Somebody from the community going to show up? And there were two people from the community who showed up. One was a fellow named Billy Wilson who was related to someone in our church, and the other was um, a lady and uh, her children. She's a single mom from the community, and she came, and boy, everybody was like, can I get you another hamburger? It was mostly a church fellowship meal. We scratched our heads and thought, well, that didn't go exactly like we thought. And someone said, well, we're going to keep doing it. So we kept doing it. The next month, community cookout, we put the signs up, flyers out, smoke on the grill, chopping lettuce and tomatoes and onions, set it all out there, waited, community cookout. One person from the community came. It was a colossal failure. It was Billy Wilson. He came back. He thought it was all right. Billy came back. We're all standing around, and we've got all this food. We're huddled up. We say, well, what are we going to do? And Billy said to us, Billy, our guest, our one guest, said to us, well, you know, I know a man who lives in a bus. We said, what? He said, I know a man who lives in a bus down there off the... You know, back behind the old store, down the road in the country, tucked away back there where nobody can find him. There's an old abandoned school bus, this guy. He just lives in his bus. And he said, hey, Billy said, every once in a while I'll pick up a breakfast burrito and carry it down to him. He said, you know what? I bet he'd appreciate it if you took him something. We said, hey, that's a great idea. And, and some people began to organize themselves and they put to get some food and they thought, we're going to go find the bus. And one of our other members said, hey, I noticed that when we go to eat at the restaurant down the way, Perini's Steakhouse, anyone? Some of you know. He said, when you turn the corner right there, there's a little rock house. That little old couple sits out on the porch and smiles and waves at people. I wonder if we could take them something. And somebody else said, I'll go. 
and they began to gather things up. And they went and they stood at Don's bus at the gate there and they hollered at Don and Don came out and he was keeping his distance. And they went down to James and Kay's house where James and Kay were on the front porch. And James and Kay welcomed them and loved on them and said, can we pray for you? James and Kay praying for us. And we said, and people came back and they started telling stories. They said, we got to go again. And all of a sudden, it wasn't, nobody was making flyers and saying, come to our community cookout. They were saying, let's go back to the same place. And they went back to the same places. And James and Kay said, you know what? We look in, James and Kay, this little old couple, said, we look after the old couple across the street. They're both in wheelchairs. He said, really? We didn't even know who that was over there. They said, yeah, we'll show you. And they took us across the street to Mike and Blanche's. And we went back again and again and again. You see what happened? When the church, really good instinct, let's love our neighbors and invite them to come here, got flipped around on its head and God said, let me propel you out. And the amazing thing about that going out to people and places that we didn't know and it was a little bit exciting but uncomfortable is that we stepped into space where we dis discovered that God was already there. James and Kay, their own ministry, praying over us, blessing us, giving things away, looking at their neighbors. They were teaching us to live Teresa of Avia's words. Because we chose to step out across boundaries. And, and as the church... God's called and sent people at Highland Oaks leans deeply into its purpose, it will find that the Holy Spirit, that life and power and vitality comes with power when the move is from Jerusalem out. We measure God's presence and God's life not by how many people we can get to somehow muster the courage to cross all the boundaries of disassociation to come be in here. But instead, to own the gift that God has given us, the resources of the Spirit and of Jesus' living presence to show us what it means to go out there and to sit with people very different than us. you gather here and raise your voices and praise and cast your eyes on this cross that's behind me here. You know why? Because that cross is to remind you that you love and adore a God who will cross every boundary to get to you. And you leave here filled with the Spirit of God commissioned by God to go cross every boundary so that the love of God might be present for you and for someone else. You gather here and you take the bread and you break it and you say, this is the body of Christ broken for us and for the world. Yes? Yes? And when you take it, you are receiving that gift, but you are also saying, we will be broken and given to for the world. And you receive this cup, and you say, this is the blood of Christ, poured out for the world. God's own self emptied for the sake of the world, and you receive that as gift for you, but when you take that cup, you answer the question, can you drink this cup? You are saying you will be poured out for the sake of the world too. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you, God's people in this place, will be witnesses in all 
Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. My prayer for you is that you leave this place with a new imagination and a new determination as you move into the places where you go from here, determined that you will cross every boundary to be present, especially in the places where people are hurting and different than you. And then you will celebrate and give praise when the love of God bubbles up right there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.